Hey gang, are you a fan of podcasts and Law & Order SVU? Well, I have the show for you. The seminal SVU podcast, Munch My Benson, is the twisted love child of co-hosts Adam Schwitters and Josh Dugan, celebrating the splendid and often wildly inappropriate lunacy found only on Law & Order SVU. Each week, Adam and Josh walk you through a random episode of SVU, all while sharing their smart and hilarious insight. Find Munch My Benson wherever it is you stream your podcast or go to munchmybenson.com for more info. That's Munch My Benson. Hey gang, let's face it, you're probably listening to this show and all of your other shows on your phone. Are you tired of filling up your phone with all of your favorite podcasts? Well, you stream your movies, you stream your music, why not stream your podcasts? Try Stitcher Smart Radio. Stitcher is an app that allows you to stream thousands of shows right to your smartphone or pad. Get the very best in comedy, entertainment, science, sports, true crime, Whatever you want, you can get it on Stitcher. I use Stitcher Smart Radio, and I love it. Find it at Stitcher.com or download the app from your app store. That's Stitcher Smart Radio. Stream your podcasts. Did I get here? And now here is your host. I'm Bobby. When we talk. All right, hello, I'm Johnny, I'm your host. Welcome to the show. I hope you guys have all had a good week. It's Friday, if that still means anything. You know, Friday used to be the day when people got all excited and they were like, oh yeah, tonight I'm going to go do this thing because I've been working all week. Tomorrow, I'm going to go do this other thing. It's going to be amazing. And then Sunday, I'm going to rest from the things I did. And then I'm going to go back to my thing on, on Monday and, and get into it and roll up my sleeves and work until Friday. Uh, I was talking to a friend of mine that was talking about how that she doesn't really have anything to look forward to in this thing, in this climate. She used to look forward to shows. She used to look forward to going and meeting up with friends. She used to, go, she used to look forward to, to, to hanging out. It's getting tough, man. The sanity is wearing thin. I know I talk about it a lot on here, but man, I'll tell you what. I think that uh I th- I think that 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 really we're starting to see people, even myself, who generally walks around like an idiot, kind of optimistic about everything and things will work out and stuff will be okay and can't we all just get along? It's a great time. The last few months have been a slap in my face. <laughs> They've been a wake-up call. It's like a uh, it's like some bigger force reached down and grabbed me by the lapels and shook the shit out of me. And now I'm like all kind of like, whoa, what's going on here? That's where I'm at right now. You know, and your sanity starts to go because you're, you know, if you're like me, you're by yourself most of the time just hanging out in the house, talking to people on Zoom. And let me tell you something, as much as I love the fact that I can reach out and do all this, I spend so much fucking time on Zoom. My skyrocket stuff is done on Zoom. These podcasts are all done on Zoom. My uh, my meetings with Austin Music Foundation, which now are a plenty, are all done on Zoom. My family hangs are done on Zoom. Some big hangs with friends, old friends, are done on Zoom. And dude, I get zoomed out. I get zoomed out. I get like I don't want to. I want to. I don't want to. <laughs> I don't want to look at my computer and talk to people anymore. Or sit there for a long time, quiet, watching people on my computer look at their computer. Look at me looking at my computer. You know what I'm saying? Like, after a little while, it starts to get fucking maddening. And you want to get out and you want to do some stuff. And you want to have stuff to look forward to. Like a weekend out somewhere doing something. But of course, you know, also, I barely work anymore. Outside the house, you know. I mean, I work inside my house all day long. From the time I wake up, generally, to the time I just kind of like blow some kind of whistle like from the Flintstones doot, doot, works over um <laughs> so so yeah but today Friday August 14th does bear some normalcy in the old world for years I've been going out almost every Friday and every Saturday and playing shows with, with Skyrocket and I've only done a couple of those as live streams since lockdown since March 7th was the last time we played together at a show at a place with people We've done a couple of live streams since then. We've had a few rehearsals. But tonight, August 14th, 
we will be playing at 8 p.m. Central Time on our Facebook page, the Skyrocket the Band on Facebook. There will be a live stream concert from our friend Darren's living room. It should be super fun. Uh, the band's super fun. It is a cover band, and we have a good time doing our thing. I will get back to doing some original live streams next week. I will announce them. I think I'm going to move my business over to Instagram Live for a show. So anyway, yeah, so I'm still playing shows. I'm still doing stuff, but my, I, I want to get out and live again. I don't know when that's going to happen, but I, I'm, I'm starting to really, really feel it. My friend Taslin Rico Muerte from the band Black Exploitation is my guest on the show today. We have a fantastic conversation about race, about the music scene in Austin, about, uh, about all the music that, that, that he's been working on and all the stuff that he's been working on. His band, Black Exploitation, the word visceral is thrown around when describing this band, and that's because the band is a punk rock band, and they are extremely real and honest in their songs. For instance, their latest single, Zero, Dying for You to Get Rich, inspired by some stuff he saw on TV. And uh, it was it was back when there was the... Uh, the, the Walmart shooting in El Paso. I think that's what it was that, that inspired that song. But the song is super intense. You'll hear it here on the show. It's their latest single. You can find them at blacksploitation.com. That's B-L-X-P-L-T-N.com. Their single Zero is spelled Z-Z-E-E-R-R-O. I didn't ask him why there's just one O. It seems a little left out. Anyway, Taz has been coming on this show for the, about the last four years. And uh, and I've seen him grow musically and grow as a person. He's gotten sober uh, like a year and a half ago or something, I think he said. But uh, he's he's hanging in there, hanging tough during this uh, during this pandemic. It's tough to be under quarantine and not have a cocktail every once in a while. So goddamn, man, my hat's off to Taz for hanging tough and being strong during this time. So enough of my yapping. Let's talk to Taz from Black Exploitation. One of my favorite bands here in Austin, and one of my favorite dudes to talk to. All right? Here's me and Taz chatting it up. Let's get down. So you're trying to stay alive yeah you know it's just weird when people say like how are you doing you know like now i mean i'm <laughs> sure it's like that for everybody now you're just like it's i a, don't know how i'm doing it's a pretty loaded question yeah i have a depends on when you ask me uh kind of vibe yeah yeah um real quick i do want to touch on uh this video and song for zero uh -huh. I know you put it out a little while back, but I was blown away, man. Word. Yeah, yeah that's Jeremy, man. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> yeah, it's Jeremy. He did the video? Yeah, he animated um, everything with um, this app. Uh, I don't recall what it's called, but it is a... I think like a he started with a phone app. Or something? app. Yeah, but it's just some some phone app i believe at first and then he moved on to an ipad and they had i guess like an updated version for ipad uh-huh but there was like four i think he said four thousand different animations to make that happen wow and he did it all he was just always like as we were recording songs for this third album like say if i was in the the recording booth you know when elliot's recording me like he would be sitting on a couch drawing just all these drawings and drawings on this big, um, I guess, sketch pad, like a giant sketch pad. And the whole time he's like, I'm working on a video. And I'd be like, oh, OK, because <laughs> it's just him with this big pad right, and right, a right. pencil. And then it, eventually it went from that and he'd be on his iPad and he started showing me little animations little by little. And I was just like, whoa, what the, you know? Yeah. So. So as far as the song, like, what did you see on TV that 
broke the camel's back to make you go write a song about? Um, you know, I've, I, I felt weird about answering that question before, you know, but I, I guess I'll tell you because like, I know you, <laughs> um, and I saw what I saw was the shooting in El Paso, you yeah. know, yeah, that really a year ago. Um, I'm, yeah. <clears throat> and I'm from, I'm from New Mexico originally. I'm from, um, Clovis, New Mexico, which is East New Mexico. And um, so I had a lot of friends that were from El Paso I grew up with um, that I'm still friends with. And I, when I just saw what happened, it just blew me away, you know. And I just, I remember seeing it like all day. And I think it was at nighttime. And I remember I just walked down to the studio and I just wrote the lyrics out like right then and there. And it was something I, I really didn't even plan on even really using, you know? Right, right. Well, it's a really yeah. powerful song. Thanks, man. Um, Really, it's and it's great. Like, I love your, uh, like, whatever inner song comes out of you, I like it. It resonates oh, with thanks. me. Yeah. Um, I, uh, so how close are you to being finished with the record? Um, well, I could say like the record's been finished probably about two different times. <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know, I, I, I look at it and I say, well, you know, um, I don't think I was clear enough when I said this or I want to add this. You know, I think I'm just kind of, man, making that third album really is like some shit, man. I've, you know, when I was doing a second album and I would hear people say like, yeah, your third album is the hardest. Like, I didn't really believe it. But now that I'm there, it's it's freaking hard. In what in what ways? Because you're trying to take new artistic steps and break out of. Or... Um, well, see, with the second one, New York Fascist Week, uh -huh. like a lot of people don't know, like that's when you know, Kati had had left the band during the making of that album so we were, had all these songs that we couldn't use anymore you know me and jonathan so like a little over half of that album was the album i already had sitting on ice which was i didn't know what i was going to do with it you know right but um so we basically deconstructed those songs and put them back together me jonathan uh autry from trail of dead uh -huh. when he's with trail of dead and Elliot from Ringo Death Star. And we wrote that album. <clears throat> and then, so this third one, though, is like now that Jonathan's not here, you know? And it's me and Jeremy. And um, it's just kind of weird creating something without one of the OG members there because it was like a collective type of thing, you know? Right. Um, and a lot of the workload has kind of moved into your shoulders. And as far as bouncing ideas off, you've lost your. Yeah. Your counterparts. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Jeremy's great, of course. You know what I mean? Like, he's my brother and everything, you know, and he's an excellent drummer and he does extraordinary work. Um, but it's like the thing about black exploitation was when there was three like black people you know Conti being born in puerto rico black latinx jonathan uh me um what made it great was there are all these different perspectives coming together to to make black exploitation with me it's difficult now because like i'm the guy and i think it's kind of one-sided like i don't, I don't want it to appear one-sided i from see the, yeah you know like the view viewpoint you know because people that are fans of our music they all like them for all different reasons you know right and that's the difficult part is trying to make sure that all these different viewpoints are still kind of translated even though it's one OG member left. Right, you know? right. So do, do you know you don't you don't have any idea when it's going to come out yet? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that was the question I was asking originally. Um I was leading I could, to it. Yeah, I could let it I could 
I, it could come out like tomorrow, you right. know? So I don't want to say that it's not finished. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. Maybe I'm looking at October. Yeah. You know, it's driving Lars crazy, and I'm pretty <laughs> sure Jeremy too and, and Elliot, you know? But like I said, I told them, like, it'll be out when, I, when I'm ready, when I feel like it's right, you know? Yeah. Um, all this craziness and everything with, I think like when this pandemic hit, what I saw was, um, all of a sudden, like an explosion of, of music and, and art, everyone's putting out their stuff. <laughs> and I feel like some of it was done in a hurry and it wasn't as good as it could have been, you know? And I don't want to be like one of those people. I don't want this to affect like the process as far as like, quality and you know relevance and you know like yeah so, yeah yeah i think there's a lot of people trying to capture something to speak on what's happening exactly right now in so many different ways like the isolation of of the pandemic for some of us the right. loss of everything for some of us the Black Lives Matter resurgence. Like, I mean, there's just, there's so much going on. It's very difficult. Like, how are you handling all of that stuff? Like, how are you handling the pandemic? See, that's the thing is like, um, a lot of those people, they seem to, I don't want to use the word thrive, but they seem to be able to put something together you know, even if it's not that good, like they're able to put something together during a time like this. Mm -hmm. Like me, I don't, I don't do well. Like, like I'm not doing well. I think as far as like, um, artistically, you know, a lot of people. I think a misconception with black exploitation is because like we're political. Um, you would think like in time, hard times that we have like a lot of material. Right, right, right. Say something that's really inspirational. You know, like, I'm not like that. I thrive when everything seems okay. You know, that's when I'm like, everybody wake up, you know? Yeah, yeah. And then when there's, like, total mayhem, like, right now and shit, like, <laughs> I just, like, I'm just sitting back, like, holy shit, you know? Yeah. And, like, I'm scared, you know? Um, I don't feel um, in uh, inspired. inspired or, yeah. you know, so... um. I mean, I'm still making music, and I think it's great, you know? I just, you know, I don't feel good about a lot of shit right now. <laughs> yeah. If any of that makes sense, yeah. Yeah, it did, but are you, uh, personally, are you, uh, how are you handling just day-to-day? -day? Um, like, do you um, exercise or, like, not watch the news or? I try not to watch the news, but, you know, I have to... Okay, this is how my day goes. I wake up, I get coffee, I make coffee, I light my my ancestral altar, I do my prayers, um, I watch a little news, I get really angry, and then I work out, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and then studio. So, like, that's how I've been dealing with it. You know, I'm also dealing with sobriety too, you know. How long so, are you how long have you been sober? One year and I guess five months. Yeah. I was I have a very good friend and I'll I'll turn you on to his podcast. He's a real cool guy. He's actually even he's Barry Gibbs' son from the Bee Gees. But oh, he yeah. he's he's gotten sober and he started this podcast about it. And in one of the ones I was listening to, it was at the start of the pandemic, and they were talking about how fucked up it was that liquor stores were viewed as essential businesses, but they couldn't go to a fucking AA meeting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? There's, yeah. It must be difficult in a culture that celebrates that sort of uh, intoxicative, if that's even a word, escapism. To yeah. try and do, especially in our business, we we work in bars. 
right. that make their money off of alcohol sales. <laughs> mm-hmm. And the and the more alcohol, the more people you can get in there to sell alcohol because your band, you know, the, the more successful your brand your band gets. Yeah. You know, and a drinking culture. So. Yeah. Has the has has the lockdown isolation made it more difficult or more stressful to stay sober, or or do you feel like at least you're just kind of hanging out at home? Okay, well, I mean, first let me start, but let me define, like, my sobriety. Okay. Shit, okay? Um, I don't drink and I don't do drugs. Okay. Right? Anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I do use cannabis. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Me too. Which I have to, you know? And I, I discovered that when I stopped drinking and doing drugs, that one of the one of the reasons why I drank and used drugs is, or I should say I should have been using more cannabis instead of drugs or alcohol because I, when I used it, it was like a really a thing to get over hangovers. Mm -hmm. I never really just used it medicinally. You know what I mean? Um, But I think like I got, um, I got, I guess a year, I got sober at the beginning of the last South by before the, the one before last the 19 right? 2019 right okay so by the time the pandemic hit i was already in practice it was like it happened for a reason i was like oh shit like i can't go anywhere uh that would have happened before i got sober i probably would have died from coronavirus seriously because i'd have been trying to get whatever i was trying to get right or i would have been in the bar drinking because of alcoholism you know what i mean yeah so it sobriety prepared me to deal with it and i already had to stop going to a lot of places and hanging out with a lot of certain a lot of different people you know so i actually dealt with being isolated pretty well you know and i live out out wolf shield ranch you know so Mm -hmm. that's away from everyone anyways there's lots of room that's where you guys did that uh the pleasure venom video right yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's nice. Yep. You've got a nice, quiet place to be. Yeah. Rocky Erickson played out here, too. Oh, really? Yep. They're on that same slab that's in that Pleasure Venom uh, video. He played on that slab for a Halloween party and had um, his, uh, like, the, it was like a haunted trail where he had all his, like, animatronics and shit. Like, oh, wow. On the trail. Yeah, it was dope, man. I got to meet him. When was that? Um, I say that was it was on Halloween. I'd say maybe it was like four years ago, maybe. Yeah. So, uh, I guess it was maybe a few years before he died. Actually, mm-hmm. yeah. I I met him a couple times, but I never really talked to him. He seemed I, whenever I met him, he seemed like he was uh, you know, he was medicated. He had been through so much stuff and. Dude, I got to sit. He was actually, he was here like at the crib for like, I don't know, like three, three or four days. He came a couple times That's and he would just awesome. be out here. So, yeah. So I got to probably have like conversations with him that, that a lot of people didn't because he was just, there was like times when he was just sitting on the porch of the studio and it was just me standing there waiting for somebody to to come back whoever was doing whatever for him you know yeah and so i would just you know ask him questions and shit and he would just answer them like like, um the the album evil one where he's talking about how he walked with a zombie and i asked him about like the middle of the song the words change where he says i walk He's something like I walk z- z- zombie or something. He doesn't finish the sentence. And I was right, like, right. is it because you're at that point in the song you've you've transformed into a zombie or something? <laughs> he was like, Wow, I never thought about that. <laughs> <laughs> so he answered all my stupid ass questions and shit. <laughs> like he was really he actually shook my hand too, which I heard he doesn't really do. Uh-huh. Like when you offer your hand, he just will look. He did, and I was, I didn't know not to, you know? Yeah, yeah. And he was just, man, just blew me away. That's probably one of the illest experiences I had in Austin, period, you know? Yeah. That's amazing. 
Um, let me ask you about what's been happening for the last couple of months, protest wise, and in our music community, and uh, and just in general, since the murder of George Floyd, there's there was we all know what's happened. There's been what I would think is some sort of uh, awakening. Yeah. At least it was for me. If uh, if if I can say that, and um, do you feel do you feel like like uh, this is actual change or is this just another? You know what I'm saying? Like I feel like yeah. like these things happen. People get involved for a little while. This one, the protests have gone on. I mean, there were protests here Saturday night. They weren't huge like they were a couple months ago, but they're still going on, and the conversation's still going. But what's your take on it? Uh, when it comes to the protests, like I, I get blown away because like I don't even know when they happen. You know, I just find out <laughs> from somewhere. I'm just like, shit, people are still protesting. Shit, yeah. like you know, it, it's not. It's not because I'm like, why are they still doing it? I'm just amazed of because I've been doing this shit like for a long fucking time. You know what I mean? And I'm just amazed that it does seem like people really have had enough, like for real this time. You know, I think it is genuine. I think I think things are going to that they're changing, you know, Um what was the other part of the question? Well, it's kind of also about our scene. There's been a lot of uh, Jackie Benson's, you know, stepped up and put on that that blues on the screen show. Right. And do you feel like those are things that are going to keep going? All of the work that Chaka has been doing and uh, tons of art, ton, like the black community of artists has come together and gotten a light shown on it. Audrey right. as well, you know, Pleasure Venom as well. Right. And so do I feel so, like Yeah, like like in in your in your experience first of all, what what was your experience as a a black man in this music community? Did you feel marginalized? Hmm. Man. Or unique? <sighs> wow. That's a good question. I mean, you're the only one that's probably like to ask me a question like that. Uh, well, I, I I respect the shit out of you, and I and I, these I are that. real things, and I think that 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 I need to be educated in a lot of ways, and if I do, then so does my audience, and and to hear it from firsthand from a person to know how we can all do better is 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 kind of my goal in this thing. Right. So do I? Did I feel marginalized yeah. or and shit? Well, yeah. I mean, yes and no. I mean, I mean the people that I I dealt with in music and shit. Um, those are like my friends. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. So I'm gonna have something biased. I'm gonna <laughs> be biased because I've been here for a long fucking time. You know what I mean? So like any venue of people that I dealt with. Um, I feel like they were going to put me on if I had something cooking that they were going to put me on just because they because I'm Taz because they know me. I've been here forever. You know what I'm saying? I've been on the scene. So my experience is probably going to be different from another black person. You know, what I mean, I do what I do know is that I was probably most of the time the only black person around. And I did have arguments with people um when it came to, I, I know when it came to conversations about music and stuff like that, um, my opinion didn't seem very valid when it came to rock and roll. Like, that's how I was looked at, uh, you know, like uh, groups of people. Um, uh, but one thing I can say is that, like, being when I when we started Black Exploitation, like when we said we we're going to be a black punk band. I think it was easier to have done it here. You know what I'm saying? Like no one, 
looked at us and said, y'all can't do that. You know, everyone was like, oh, cool. Really? All right. And, and that's one thing I like about Austin is like it's it being very accepting as well, because a lot of fucked up opinions I had and shit and ignorance, like I don't think that way anymore, you know. But as far as my experience, uh, do I feel marginalized? I I don't know. I know I know the, uh, that there are people though that have that have been mistreated or looked over and shit. I mean, uh, okay, let me. I look think at it's the, more of a the, being looked over thing than. Yeah. Look. Uh, okay. Well. Yeah. Then that. Yeah. Definitely. I've been looked over. Like on. I mean. Fun fest. When that was around, you know, at that time, during the last year, few years of it, we were doing Afropunk fests on big stage in front of like 2000 people and shit. You know, we were getting flown to New York to do one off shows and shit. Then we live in Austin and you all can't put us on one of the stages. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. There was like no way they were even trying to hear it at all. For some reason, we're just like, we must have pissed somebody off or so. I don't know what it is. And then it just went to Fun Fest, just not wanting any local people, really, period, you know. And then they tried to go and do so- another one after that. And I would see people, um, whatever festival that was at the Fun Fest, then I would see people that, that would start bands that weren't, weren't great at all, really didn't have any kind of fan base. And they would get put on, and I'd be like, what the fuck, you know. And same thing with fucking ACL, man. Same thing with ACL. So, yeah. Like the ACL is not trying to have no black exploitation play no show, you know, on a stage, you know. Uh, Can I ask you a question? Because I'm I've I've always been uh, I've been DIY and I've been an indie guy, but I've never been a punk guy. Uh huh. W- wouldn't it? It seems like at some point, not playing ACL as a punk band would be a badge of honor. Yeah. Because, like, maybe we're too scary to fucking put up there with Janelle Monet. You know what I mean? Yeah. But... I mean, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm just asking. Like, I mean. I don't know. I just feel like. I feel like people really don't know what they like. You know what I'm saying? And I think they just try to create this space sometimes of what they think people should be listening to and shit. You know? Yeah. And how can you tell if you never give people the opportunities, you know? You're like, right. Some people may like want to come to ACL and hear punk. Some people might want to come to ACL and hear cumbia. You know what I'm saying? Like sure. some people may want to come and hear dance hall or whatever. But like how would you know? And Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. What I, I mean, I would like, I want to, I want, as a punk band, I want to play in places where, you know, where normally you wouldn't hear punk. You know, I would love to play a fucking ACL show. Yeah, I believe Everything. I'm a huge fan of Bills where it's not like the same different versions of the same band over and over again or artists. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like I wouldn't, I I think I would enjoy a Janelle Monae black exploitation show. <laughs> I don't think Janelle Monae would want to do any shows. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're the, probably the last people to, you know. Yeah, yeah. So uh, <laughs> let me ask you this, man: How? how what are you gonna do? How are you going to put out an album like this? When you, If you do it in October, say things are still closed down, you can't go do a show or anything like that. Like what, What's your take on that? Hmm. Well, I'm trying to, trying to think of music in a different way now, like when you release it. And more of like um, like this this package, you know what I'm saying? Like there's like a, a you have the album, and then you have basically um, the video version of the album, 
you know, and where it's like a video for every single song and kind of putting it together like it's almost a short film, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and releasing, thinking of thinking about releasing music now as like a almost like a mini movie. Yeah. You know, um, you can have that idea. It's cool. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> anyone listening? Yeah. I, that's <laughs> that's how I'm what I'm looking into. You know what I'm saying? I think because things are so streamable, everything's stream, stream, stream. Yeah, 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 yeah. It makes music kind of disposable. Like you need to have something that makes them remember it, you know? Yeah, you know, uh, not to go back to this again, but the, 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 so far, one of the best things I've seen that someone's released under the pandemic is that Pleasure Venom video. It was put together. It's live, but it's shot. There's some production to it. It's not a guy like me in his studio with his acoustic guitar, you know. <laughs> Why doesn't anybody love me? It was like a real, it was like a show and it was exciting. Even though there wasn't people there. Yeah. Yeah. I guess that depends a lot on the band, doesn't it? Definitely. It, man, Pleasure Venom is is just, I don't know, Audrey's just an amazing individual. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, because um, I'm there, like, behind the scenes, you know? So, like, I can tell you, like, when they shot that, that video, it was hot as a motherfucker outside. Yeah. You know? It was like unbearably hot. Yeah. You know, and um, and they're on that concrete slab. So the sun was just beating down. And the thing is, is like they were out there for a long time waiting for the sun just to go down a little bit. Right. And it was once it got to that certain point, it was still really hot. So they get up there and they just. I don't know. They just have. The, uh, see, that's what I'm saying. Like that shit is so dope. But they did like a lot of people don't have that, man. It's just. They, I don't know. You, go you have that. Place. There's a lot. I mean, there's like a visceral that that word is is thrown around when describing your music a lot. And it's same thing, sort of thing that it's it's interesting that you belong in the same kind of like family. You know what I mean? You guys both make records with Elliot. You're kind of managerially familyed together. Right. And mm -hmm. uh, you both have there's like an electricity to to your to your performance and your music like a palpable electricity thank you yeah <laughs> i think um i think it's just because like coming in like uh, when you say like you're a punk or you're i don't like to say black punk but a punk that happens to be black you know what i mean like you just have to come in there like bombastically and shit you know what i'm saying yeah and and like that's why i was like yo when i perform i'm gonna get in people's faces i'm gonna stand on a bar i'm gonna do this and that because that's exactly what people expect me not to do you know and i think audrey she does the same thing you know like it's just me being a black man and and being in a punk band, band is just crazy to some people but being a black a black woman in this day and age where people expect you to be a fucking rapper. Yeah. You know what I mean? Or R and B singer yeah. or some shit like that. Yeah. A uh, video girl. You know what I mean? Those is those are like the stereotypes for black women in in videos, props or or, you know, whatever. And so her coming in punk, like she's gonna there's no way she's gonna play second fiddle to anybody when she gets that microphone. You know what I mean? There's not gonna be any question is, is is she punk? You know what I mean? Or if she's good enough, she's gonna fucking kill that shit. You know? Yeah. Immediately, that's a lot of people when they see black people with instruments doing punk. The first thing they're looking to say is, "Well, that's not really punk." You know? Like I noticed that too. You know? So people like us, we just gotta, you know? Yeah, that's weird because when you go when you go through the history of punk and the real history of punk death yeah death was pure hell yeah, yeah. they were the prototype mhm mm yeah pure hell too man i don't know have you ever listened to no them? no 
Yeah, look, they were like around the same time, damn near. You know, they're from Philadelphia. Uh, Pure Hell um, was a song, their album called Noise. Um, some Noise Addiction or some shit like that. Yeah, they were supposedly like they toured with Sex Pistols and everything, and they were supposed to be like right after them. They're on the same level label or something, uh-huh, but the uh-huh. label had went under. But yeah, they were like straight up running through the hood in in North Philadelphia in high heels, like fighting local gangs to get, to get on a train, <laughs> get to the studio, and then have to fight all the way back to get home in freaking high heels and fishnets and shit you know like yeah fucking back then dude yeah you know so i love pure hell too man i'm gonna check them out yeah what what do you think uh because there there's always been a pretty defined to me a defined idea generationally of what punk is at that time you know you have like the sex pistols era and the ramones era and this was this sort of thing and then all of a sudden bands like the clash started branching out and doing coloring outside of those lines but but it was still kind of punk also like a band like talking heads or television or something yeah they were just being different and being themselves it I, this might be a really hard question to answer but it's one that I'm I really want to know the answer to is what is punk rock in 2020 wow punk rock in 2020 I think punk rock in 2020, like what's the sound or, or just like, what it is? Yeah, but like, is, like what does it mean now? Because it uh, used to be like just snubbing your nose at authority and making simple music that, was, that anybody could make to express this ah! inside of them. Yeah. I think punk rock right now is music is, is something that can with I guess well, what is going on right now is like something that can probably land you in, in fucking federal prison or some shit. Talking about if saying the things <laughs> that need to be said right now could probably get you in some trouble or you know get you watched like how they used to do ice T and NWA and all those guys back yeah, then, yeah, yeah, you know, when yeah. Reagan and, and George Bush senior were president. Yeah. That's the kind of situation we're in right now because the things as punk as being this, this device to talk about unrest or, you know, snubbing your nose with authority right now. And that, and this time is something different because like of who's doing it and why, why they're doing it, you know? And what's happening and shit. It's just like you're talking about some dangerous fucking people, you know? Yeah. So, uh, yeah. That's why I'm real careful um, about what I say in songs, what I post um, on social media. I make sure, like, what I'm saying is very clear, you know? Yeah, and and not left to any interpretation because uh, they're making just some, they're passing some crazy policy and stuff right now. It seems that affects people like us or people on the left, and you know musicians. Yeah, I don't know. Sorry, I don't mean to get all <laughs> dark and shit. No, uh, I mean that's a real thing. You know that people should be thinking. I do wonder sometimes about people. I'm like. Even like famous people, you're like, God, dude, you're gonna get like audited. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. You read their shit. But, I mean, yeah. I don't even know what they do. I don't know what they do. I don't know. I don't know. Well, what was that I was reading? Um, I think it was Kevin Curtin posted something on Twitter about a story, and I don't want to get the publication wrong. But they were talking about how there's basically like this relationship that some department within the police department has with all these different, like basically like um, confidential informants, you know, 
uh, some are citizens, some are people are in churches and all kinds of shit, you know. And what these people do is they they see things on the internet and or at bars or clubs and they report it to this database and this the police department, this department within a department makes like these files and like these blacklists on on people you know i'm pretty sure black exploitation has if this shit is true you know right, apparently right, right. they got hacked or whatever it's called uh, damn if you go to twitter and you look at kevin curtin's shit like maybe three weeks ago and look at a story he posts it's all about it but that's what i'm saying is just like now saying being punk and saying what needs to be said you know just some very different consequences like in this day and age. Yeah. And you have to really, it's going to separate like the posers from, you know, the real motherfuckers and shit. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Can I ask you, uh, I wanted to ask you just because of zero there's at the end, you go off on this. Did you ever listen to, were you ever a Bill Hicks fan? The comedian? The comedian? Yeah. No, but my friends tell me jokes. He said, yeah. And never, I couldn't say I was a fan, yeah. There's like one of his records ends with like this thing going over and over again. Like, go to sleep, America. We'll take care of you. Just turn on your TV. Go to sleep, America. We're taking care of you. <laughs> like, just this really wow. freaky like message from the government. <laughs> no shit? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and it's kind of kind of like the end of zero right where the tv yeah yeah the way you keep on like saying this and you're just like oh i wonder if 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 he ever like heard those hicks bits no i never heard those (laughs) because they're ones that even apply to now they're like they're like 30 years old at this point you know like from 1990 and he's saying stuff like like man i was in my hotel room i was watching cnn and and the more i watched it the more i realized like it's the end of the world like the world is fucking ending I turn it off and I open the door and it's just a regular day and birds are singing. Like (laughs) these people freak me the fuck. And it's weird because now it's not just CNN, you know, since 1990, it's grown into this army of like opinionated new infotainment or something. Yeah. It's like not even the news. No. You know, I don't like what, I mean, I, I watch the news, but one thing I can say is just like, I even crew, I, I even go, like cruise by Fox News and see what they're saying on there and shit. Just, just so I can know, yeah, yeah. you know, we kind all of do. bullshit <laughs> they're talking about. But there's bullshit on CNN oh, yeah. and MSNBC too. It's all it's like news entertainment. It's not even the news, right? And what pisses me off is that there's like real shit going on in the world. Yes, and they focus everything on Donald Trump. Every single it's, little fucking thing he yes. does, and there is real shit going on everywhere else that we don't talk about. And on top of that, what pisses me off is like, they kind of, they keep doing it, right? They just, they know this. They get ratings. Talking about. Yeah. Right. And they're the, they're partially to blame why he's in fucking office right now, because partially, I mean, they're like 90% (laughs) to blame. (laughs) They got, he got billions of dollars worth of TV time for free. Still to this day. Still to this day. You yeah. know, and no one still hasn't tried to do anything about the Electoral College or anything because they've been like sitting there talking about this idiot. And it's like, I could care less on most of the shit he says or does. Like, I mean, not, not let me take that back. Most of the things when he lobs insults at people and shit like that online, it's a fucking news story every time. Why are you surprised? Of course, he's insulting someone smarter than him. Yeah, yeah. But is it really news? You know what I'm saying? Um, I don't know. It just it like I said, it's entertainment. It's it, you go to M- MSNBC, CNN. It's for people to have their opinions stroked, you know, who believe what's put on there. And Fox News, fucking same thing. Yeah, you know, it's news for you, catered to you for your opinion. Yeah, so that they can <laughs> sell more fucking ads. More ads. And yeah. a lot of some of those ads are like off. I saw one today. I was like, oh, it was about um, the one with Tom Selleck. Yeah, that's the other where thing. Where he tries to steal old people's houses and shit. 
and then and then and then the commercial is on <laughs> and that's what you, see. you know what i'm saying like y'all know this is bad but then y'all showing this motherfucker's commercial on this shit well, like here's the thing that happens to me when i go to those channels is that i'm like everything is like erectile dysfunction the old yeah. people are gonna we're gonna take your house uh, it's all real old people stuff. And I'm like, is this like, who's watching these channels? Is it like really old people? Cause you know, they know who their demographic is. Exactly. It's for people in nursing homes, you know? Yeah. And stuff like that. Old people, retirees, you know, and they just feed them like half truths and straight up lies. Um, like what Tucker Carlson say the other day, he said something, Lars was telling me about it. Um, that Joe, <laughs> that Biden, if he has like his choices for VP are all are just three black women, mm -hmm. then that might be illegal because that's discrimination, and he doesn't even know if that's legal, you know. And so then it's like he tells that to some old person who doesn't even, you know, bless their heart, probably not even know how to use their smartphone to even fact check this information they just take it from Tur tucker carlson and and believe you know just yeah. they just feed it bullshit it's like dude tucker carlson if if that were the case then that would make every presidential run up until now totally Ill Ill illegitimate because it was all white folks and all white yeah. dudes and all white cat like what are you talking about yeah you know people don't re i don't know I I've had I've had some serious bout like my dad and hasn't talked to me since March. Cause oh, of, because because of my views. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, he's on that Tucker Carlson train, man. And my sister, uh -huh. the same thing. Like you know, there's like this. You know, there. It, it's weird. It's a, the information that people are getting is so divisive. No one's trying to kill anyone, and that's the message that they're like the. Trump's trying to kill all Americans. The liberals are trying to kill all Americans so that Trump doesn't get real. It's just like this kind of like just extremely ridiculous shit. Yeah, everything is very extreme. Yeah. The thing about me is like, you know, I'm neither, I'm not left nor right. I'm not center or or anything like that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, I just, I just try to, just go by like what's wrong and what's right you know what i mean yeah and we just get into a level like first of all i'm not going to try to sympathize with the right like any with anything that they do you know what i'm saying no i'm just saying like they they are so ugly that <laughs> i see that ugliness starting to affect the left you know mm -hmm. and the way they view people or some of the things that they say um not knowing who who it affects you know right. like like name calling and shit yeah you know yeah Are you calling you saying someone on the right like oh they're retarded and, you know like some calling someone on the right retarded yeah. you know yeah and how that may affect someone that's on your side yeah is just it's just getting to this level of like ugliness that that it can only end one way you know what i mean because i you know, the way I grew up is just like the name calling. It always ends one fucking way. <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And that's where everyone's heading, like two bullet trains heading right toward each other. Pretty soon. And it already kind of has, you know, the violence that's erupted between each other. Yeah. And um, I was, uh, I've, I've been on stage and I've threatened people. And black exploitation on stage. I said, any transphobia, any racism, any, like we'll stop the show, we'll get off here, and we'll knock your fucking teeth out. Get back on stage and keep playing like it's nothing. You know what I mean? Yeah. I've said that, and I've seen people. I was like, if you don't like it, you can walk out. And I've seen people walk out. You know? And I look back on it now, and I'm just like, there's like a totally another way, <laughs> way I could have went about that. <laughs> And just being ugly towards people, um, I don't know. I just try to make sure I do the reading and have facts and try to base my arguments on that rather than name, than name calling and assault. Yeah, that's the name calling <laughs> is where I find uh, 
maybe not in your case there, but there, there is, it seems like that's when you've run out of facts. That's really the only place you can go is you're stupid, you know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. I saw this interview, um, with, uh, what's his name? I want to say his name is, I'm sorry if I'm wrong, maybe King Tony on, uh, Vlad interviews, who is a guy who is at one point, he was a leader of, Latin Kings and he's one of the leaders in New York City he did a bunch of time in jail and he's getting out telling his story and he said when he first got to Rikers Island like he was really angry he's talking about how he had joined the Latin Kings but he was really angry he's getting a lot of fights um, I think he had maybe carried out a stabbing or two because he was a little guy and he was just always angry trying to, to fight people and he said one of the older guys who was a Latin king pulled him to the top side and said, why are you mad all the time? Like, why are you angry? Because you're stupid. <laughs> and he was like, he said he wanted to get mad, but it made him think because at the time he was fucking illiterate. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. And like, that's how I look at ever since he was telling that story. Like I look at, I, I have to re like assess like why I'm angry, you know? And I have to go and do research about something before I just lash out at people like who say something that I don't agree with. And a lot of times, like, yeah, because I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't have a defense for that because I don't know the facts yet, you know. And I so I wouldn't like call them a name. Yeah. Like, let me get the facts straight because those hurt way more. They were worse anyway, you know. Yeah. So, man, uh, I love talking to you, Taz. And I'm I'm really Likewise. I'm happy for you uh in your sobriety. And I have one request. What's that? I think you and Lars need to invite me out to the ranch to hang out. See the studio. I'll wear a mask. Oh man, cool. that's that's any time, man. Yeah. Any time, G. Uh any time. Yeah. Uh people can look forward to this new album coming out in October, but or maybe October. But until then, Go see the video for Zero. Is there anything else coming down the line anytime soon? Uh, my my um, A Boy album will probably be... That's finished. That's probably going to be dropping around at the uh, same time. Okay. The, uh, the ABOI, Absolutely, absolutely oh, yeah, yeah. Bereft of Imagination. That's probably going to drop too. All right. Definitely. Excellent. Um. Is, I'm, I know there's probably a lot of stuff I'm missing, but is there anything you want to cover before we go? Mm, I probably would think probably would think of it later. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> well, no, Chad, I mean, yeah. I just want to say fucking everybody, love y'all, and just hold on and be well to each other. Yeah. <laughs> yeah and black exploitation is not done and i'm also working on another punk band i can't really talk about right now what but it's gonna be it's surprise who's in it yeah and it, it's gonna be fucking dope is that i'm not gonna give anything away but in an email exchange with lars she said you were working on a tune a couple of days ago and it's gonna be sick Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah, the the fuck man, I'm telling you, Flim TV, the third album is fucking amazing. Okay. There's just little little bitty things that I just want to fix. I'm always working on shit. It's fuck I think it it's good. It just has to be better than New York Fascist Week. Right, right. And I'm not gonna put it out till I, I know for sure. Well good. You shouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> it has to be better. And it, and people should also listen to my a uh, boy stuff too. Okay. You no, know, I had I was I only have two videos for that, and I was making the third one, and um, I kind of had to, which was finished, but I didn't like the way it came out, but I kind of had to put it on pause because I started doing this thing with the a boy stuff, which is like dark wave and stuff, and they got really good reviews on Afro punk and all this different shit, and then I was noticing that. Um, I was, somebody was kind of ripping me off, you know, like, (laughs) 
doing what I was doing and using like my color stories and shit oh, like really? my video. Yeah. So I was like, hold on. Like, let me let me stop what I'm doing here right now and let me fix a few things because like I don't want any kind of comparisons, but um yeah, I had to I had to stop that for a second. Fix well, a few things. Glad you did. Yeah. But I love I love doing the boy shit, man. And that's really just me and Elliot Frazier. Um, it's my, pro- my mine and his production. And then uh, I think Jeremy plays in a few songs. I'll put links to it uh, in the text of the body of this podcast when it comes out, so people can check it out. Cool. Yeah. Well, man, great talking to you. I'll be in touch and see if I can come out and visit. Yeah, man. You just let us know. Yeah. Anytime, or I'll let you know too. Especially, we're trying to build this drive-in over out here. So, yeah, nice. All right, man. Well, great talking to you as always, and uh, I'll let you guys know when this when the show drops. Okay. Oh, one last thing. Okay. <laughs> you have you have a a record called uh, "Boy in the Box." Yes, sir. Is that it? Yep. Um, I was in the studio just the other day with Elliot. And he had his kid with him. And I had I had it uh he pressed play on the you know those record players, the record, and then it has a CD player. It uh-huh. looks like old fashioned. I have one of those in the studio. And um he comes up to the house and he's like, Hey man, he's like, What do you have in your CD player? I was like, I, I don't know what's in there. And he's like, he was saying bottom he he turned he pushed play on the thing and it said all I heard was she's a sex machine. <laughs> Are you talking about like a little kid? Yeah, yeah, I know Bonham. He was like four years old. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, well, I think and I turned, it was your CD. And I just died laughing. I was like, yeah, it's John's Gowdy CD. I'm about to do his, his uh, show, you know, in a few days. Well, I'm flattered that my CD was in your CD player and tell, uh, tell Elliot sorry about Bonham. <laughs> oh, yeah. My it's music is not for kids. <laughs> Yeah, you put an explicit sign on there. Explicit content. <laughs> explicit. Yeah. Well, do great talking right. to you, man, as always. Oh, yeah, likewise, man. Take care, brother. All right, peace. Taslin Muerte from Black Exploitation. Find them at blackexploitation.com. Check out their songs, they're everywhere. You can also check out his uh, Dark Wave groove. He's called A Boy, A B O I. Man, Black Exploitation is such a great band. And I love talking to Taz, man. Always have. I'm very proud of him for getting sober, man. That's a hard thing to do. I'm glad he did it. I'm glad he's staying on the straight and narrow. And uh, I bet this is a hard time to stay sober if you're trying to stay sober. So, uh, anyway, you can check out their song Zero, which you're hearing there. And you'll hear the rest of it in just a second when I stop talking. Uh, you can hear the rest of it wherever it is you stream and download your jams. It's it's spelled Z Z E E R R O. Black exploitation is spelled B L X P L T N dot com. All right, gang. Don't forget when you're out there checking out blackexploitation dot com, you can subscribe to this podcast wherever it is you stream podcasts. Be it Spotify, Apple Podcasts, TuneIn, Overcast, Stitcher, anywhere they have podcasts, you get you get How Did I Get Here. You can even ask Alexa to play How Did I Get Here. You can ask Google to play How Did I Get Here. It's insane. Sometimes it plays a stupid fucking song, but normally it plays my podcast. Let's hear the rest of this song by Black Exploitation. I want to thank Taz for coming on again. Taz Muerte from Black Exploitation. This is their song Zero, Dying for You to Get Rich. You gotta do it. Do it. Have a good day. Let's get down. Let's get down. 